When did you first come to college? Oh, uh, that was back in 1952, oh. uh, a long time ago, which I've almost forgotten now. But in those days, the uh, interviewing panel was five people, mm. uh, unlike the one person they have nowadays. And it was quite distinguished. They had uh, Johnny Walker, who was a rather famous re registrar in those days. Mm -hmm. And there was Hopkin, who was the um, departmental... Uh, like Derek Jones. Yes, Derek Jones' yes. character. Yeah. And there was um, Irwin, who mm. was uh, a lecturer then, uh, Toombs, oh, yes. and in fact Daniel Rutenberg, who was, uh, oh. I think, responsible for uh, tutorials, although there was no tutorial system in those days, mm. no individual tutorial system. And uh, it was a bit daunting to be coming up from Devon as a sort of local yokel mm. to uh, five distinguished people facing you. Um, but they were quite good, uh, except that Toombs asked a question. Having found out that I used to play the violin badly, um, he uh, asked me the question, uh, what was the difference between F sharp and G flat? Which, uh, luckily, I sort of invented something which apparently was fairly true. Uh, I said fine. they were the same note on the piano, but diff they came from different keys. I didn't know what I was saying, but it seemed to meet with his <laughs> approval. <laughs> so. Fine, and I got through the interview, okay? Mm, good. Yep. So any, uh, what happened to you as an undergraduate? Well, several things, of course. Uh -huh. But um, I remember meeting uh, um, John Carpenter, mm -hmm. who you might remember. Yes. Uh, John is the sort of person who gets younger as he goes on. Absolutely. In those days, he was almost a baby. Um, <laughs> but I met him when I was doing mechanical engineering, which is something we did quite a lot of in those days. I was bending beams to destruction. And I was not terribly interested, I must say. And, uh, perhaps I was showing signs of uh, boredom. And John came up and gave me a, a lecture about you had to do things that you were told, laddie, or you wouldn't get on. <laughs> so I took this, uh, this to heart, and perhaps that helped me a bit in the, right. in the future years. So, when, th when you graduated, uh, what happened then? You went to industry? Yes, I spent yeah. uh, a couple of years um, as a graduate apprentice mm -hmm. at GEC and uh, enjoyed it very much. And I, but I decided I hadn't really learnt terribly much in the, in the years here. And I came back to consolidate the thing and did a PhD in 1957. Mm. Um, I came back to work under Dr. Boothroyd, who was then Cherry's, Professor Cherry's uh, um, reader yeah. on transistor circuits and uh, he was the king in those days mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I entered the transistor li um, laboratory where I met you amongst other people. Gosh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, well, it was an uh, interesting time. Who were the characters in the lab? Well, uh, it was you, of course. Yeah, we'll, we'll forget <laughs> that one. <but laughs> uh, I met you there for the first time. <coughs> and, uh, oh, there were um, all sorts of people. John Sagis, who I'm, uh, I've been friendly with ever since, right. uh, he was there. And there was, well, in fact, there were about 15. And I think you and I were about the only Englishmen during the time. Uh, it, that was the days of the Athlone Fellowship, which was a fellowship given by the Canadian government to send people over here for experience in postgraduate work. Sadly, no longer. Right. But those days, there were a lot of Canadians around, mm. and they came in all hues. There was uh, Fred Profimenkov, oh, yes. who was a Russian-Canadian. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There was Clem Lemire, yep. who was a French-Canadian. French -Canadian. Um, there were English-Canadians. There were <coughs> all sorts of people. We had um, Joseph Cox, who was from H Hungary. Mm -hmm. He came out of the 1956 uh, Revolution walked out of Hungary with nothing, right. and uh, he was quite a character. And he got a PhD in three years, which was fairly yeah. unusual in those days. You, you survived your uh, PhD days. I remember that we came up with a uh, a rule that any digital circuit had to be composed of 2.2k resistors. Do you remember that? Is that right? Yes. No, oh yes. Very yeah. fundamental law of I've physics. I've come on that. since, and I use 1k and oh, 33ks, right. things like Progress. that. Progress. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you came back to college as a lecturer. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 did you have a grueling interview? Uh, 
Well, I, I was working for Plessy at the time in, in Roque Manor, the country retreat. Mm. And uh, I had a phone call from my old, old supervisor, Boothroyd, to say there was a job coming up. Would I like to apply for it? Had I ever thought of teaching? So I said I had, and I was interested. So, Julie, I came up, and Boothroyd worked for um, Professor Cherry in those days. Mm -hmm. So I came up for an interview with Cherry. And unlike the interviews of today, it wasn't very grueling, really, because Cherry said a bit about the department, what he did, etc. Then he said, um, Roy, Roy Boothroyd, Roy says you're a good chap. So I said, well, that's very nice of him, etc. He said, well, now I've got two salaries I can, uh, I can offer you. How much are you getting at the moment? So I told him. And he said, well, you'll, you'll need the second then. <laughs> and just about that was it. That was it. Uh, mm. So I, I'm afraid I'm probably here under false pretenses because uh, I'm sure I wouldn't go get through the grueling interviews they have these yeah. days. But they were the, the halcyon days of the 60s. Did you know uh, Dennis Gabor when you were here? Well, vaguely. Of course, I knew of him. Yeah. And uh, uh, in fact, he always seemed to annoyingly know more about my research than I did. Mm. Uh, so I was reduced to confusion often when I talked to him. But yes. I remember one time he was attending a seminar given by one of his students right. and uh, a bit in awe of, of Gabor, really, his reputation. And he come, came and sat next to me. So I was a bit on my metal and he was fumbling around his pocket for something. I thought, what's he doing? He came out with a tube of spangles and said, have a spangle. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the oh. mystery was uh, mystery diffused was a bit. Diffused, and, uh, right. He was a very nice and human, yeah. human man, apart from being quite oh, yeah, brilliant. He course. was. Yeah. But of course, you, you worked a long time with uh, Bruce Sayers. Oh, yes. Um, well, funny enough, I was interviewing third year project students with Sayers, and we um, were talking in the interim. And uh, I hadn't realized, but Sayers was always on the lookout. Oh. He was actually interviewing me, I think, at the time. Ah. <laughs> and at the end of the, uh, the session with the students, he, uh, he said, would I like to join him in, in uh, his engineering and medicine section? Mm. So I, uh, I said yes. And I had many years interesting and uh, enjoyable time there, where I met, amongst others, um, Norman Ellis, ah, who Norman, was quite a legend yes. in, his, yeah. in his son. And Norman was uh, one of these people who had done everything, knew everything. And apart from knowing anything, he knew everything down to the last nut and bolt. He was a very obsessive man and wouldn't let anything go until he'd really, really conquered every aspect. Of do, you it. Have, do you have an example of that? Um, yes, um, well, several actually, but uh, one in fact was, well, to, to show his obsessiveness, he was vigilating the exam one day. Mm -hmm. And as was his wont, Derek Jones, who was the deputy director in those days, as you may remember, oh, no. many people will remember him, he um, came in to Norman and said, um, everything all right, Norman? And Norman said, yes. Well, he said, there's a student over there who's behaving a bit oddly. He seems to get stuck from time to time, but then he looks up at the ceiling and then he goes down, he writes feverishly for a bit, then stops, and then looks up at the ceiling again, apparently to get inspiration, and then writes furiously. So Jones says jokingly, I expect he's got the answers written up there, Norman. Norman, completely dead faced, said, Oh no, I've looked. <laughs> 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 that just about yeah. sums up Norman. Sure. Uh, his obsessiveness with things. Right. Very careful. What happened after, after your time in medicine? Did you continue? No, in well, that field? I, I um, say as in fact um, moved, moved on, and he, he became head of the department, mm. and he reorganized a lot of things, and mm. amongst which uh, the engineering and medicine rather changed its spots and uh, new people there. And he decided that my talents lay more in. Uh, instrumentation, etc. Right. So uh, he asked me if I'd t set up and take over a, a small section on microprocessor applications, mm. elect microelectronic applications, which I did. And 
as my staff, I got uh, Dick Wilde, ah. who, uh, yes. well, we became very great friends. We used to go out hunting together. One of the things what we... What did you hunt? Uh. Well, <laughs> one of the things was we, we got uh, uh, involved in the MatCon, government mm. quango, I think you'd call it, which um, the brief was that you, you would act as consultants to anybody who wanted to employ microprocessors, right. anybody in industry that was, and particularly to small industry. Yeah. And uh, as a consultant, you could be phoned up and, sit, and, and somebody who thought they may have some, some need for microprocessors would mm -hmm. invite you over to right. see their operation. Sure and to um, see whether anything could be done. So the idea was we, we gave a free feasibility study, wrote the report, mm -hmm. submitted it to the firm, and if they liked it, it may then lead on to uh, development of some yeah. uh, process or gadget or something. And we had uh, a good time together. Um, looking back on your time, uh, what, whether, what was the high point? Uh, were there any hilarious situations uh, you've got anything in mind because you know as much as i do i think well i probably that. do <laughs> yeah yes well there was a time of course when uh, you um you, you and i were shared a flat in i Notting seem to Hill. remember that remember yes yeah and um for some reason or other you used to take bars in the day i think you were working so hard at night you i think i think that was the reason yes. yeah probably yes. or, or something like that anyway um this came this day when you decided to take a bath in the afternoon. And we had a bathroom in the flat which was on a half landing between the our right. Dranfall flat and the flat upstairs. And this had been an add-on, I think, and they had a very old, ancient, rather small bath. That's right. And it was in the back of the house and there was a bay window. That's right. With a net curtain around it, looking out into the Conwell Garden with and I think people were sunbathing out there, mm. etc. You had this bath about three o'clock in the afternoon, and you were sitting in, as I believe, <laughs> although I like didn't that. see this, <laughs> sitting in a sort of hunched position with this small bath. And suddenly there was a sort of loud ping, mm. and the net curtain fell down. That's right. Leaving you revealed um, to all the to people all sunbathing the in right. a bay window. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, it may be apocryphal, but the story goes oh, that you waited until uh, dark to get out of the bath? Or um, well, that sounds like a fair story. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Anyway, yes. Um, it was a pretty rickety flat, but it was good fun. It was good fun. And it was very good by candlelight yes. for parties. In the cold light of day, it was pretty crummy, I think mm. is the word. Yes. Crummy, I think, was... Cr yeah, but... Um, it was all right by candlelight. Yes. Well, we, we chose it for the party facilities. Well, you did, I think. We I did. I <laughs> <laughs> you were always right. a party man. Yes. Well, yeah. um, if, if you had to advise uh, your son, grandson, or whatever, whether to come to Imperial College to do the same thing as you did, what, what advice would you give him? Or her? Sorry. Well, my children have all opted not to do that. I think oh. I have a bad advertisement for this place. Um, uh, but I, I thought it's a great place, and in fact, I, I've met a lot of very nice, talented, and very, uh, very nice people. Right. Um, I don't know. The, I think with children, you should let them do what they want to do. In fact, yes. so I, I don't try to influence them <laughs> either way. But um, if they if they came today, I think they they have to be prepared to work very hard mm. and uh, they have to compete with some very bright students yep. and uh, if they can get through the, the standard then they'll find it very rewarding, they'll, yes. they'll get a very good degree, get a good career, sure. but you do have to um, work fairly hard. I, I think what I'd like to do now is to be able to hand you a red book and say Colin Vickery, this is your life. <laughs> uh, well, I hope there's a bit more of it to come yet. Oh, but, yes, uh, ind indeed. Um, I, I've, as you know, retired for two days a week. Uh, right. I'm sorry, I've retired for three days a week. Three days a week. Right. I come in two days a week, and uh, I find this is quite a gentle way to retire. I wouldn't yeah. want to leave the place no. cold and completely, uh, because it is great, and you get you get used to being institutionalised, yeah. and you drop into the library and this sort of thing. And you, you come and talk over things with your colleagues. 
Yeah. And uh, so I think this is quite a good way out, but I hope I've got a few, few years yet. Oh, absolutely. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.